to have you meet Allison Elvo, who is the chair of the Western Committee of her local uh, 600 in IOTSE. Allison and I have collaborated together to put this conversation uh, before you tonight, and we're very excited to have our colleagues here with us. Um, really, for one of the first times that we've all come together to speak public publicly. We've been working together for a few years behind the scenes and having different conversations. It's been powerful to be part of a surge in uh, the unions and guilds of our entertainment industry coming together over the last five years. Um, green committees, sustainability committees have been forming across locals in every production city. It's a nationwide movement and most of us are we're involved in national guilds and unions. Um, all of us here tonight are working on our sets to promote decarbonization and we're going to introduce ourselves now and give their, everybody's going to give you just a short highlight of what their priorities are in their individual union and local and um, and then we'll get a little bit deeper as we go. Todd, you want to start? Yeah, thanks Lydia. Um, hi everybody, I'm Todd Holland. I'm first vice president of the Directors Guild of America and co-chair of the State Sustainable Future Committee with Lydia Pelcher and Mary Jo Winkler. Um, and we formed three years ago uh, with great excitement from our national board and uh, the Richards Guild is very focused on education and the four pillars of our focus are leadership and communication, let your voice be heard, carbon calculation, if you can measure it, you can manage it, clean energy, fuel and set power and materials, design, reuse and waste, so it's no surprise that this has become an inter-guild effort. And that's the director's guild. Hi everyone, I'm Allison Elvove. I'm a camera operator and the Western Region Chair of the Local 600 Sustainability Committee. Um, we were founded in 2019 and we were really inspired by the 2021 PGA Call to Action letter that came out in October of that year. They called for reducing carbon emissions by 50% by the year 2030. And so we set out to figure out what our mission should be and we defined it based on education and action. So the education component, of course, is panels like these. Um, it's creating resources and documents for our members. Um, and then the action component is things like we do um, e-waste recycling uh, events, we do community cleanups, things like that. And so, um, you know, as we looked to our mission, we kept discussing the fact that, you know, here we are in LA and we are, um, you know, the entertainment capital of the world, as they say, and the California is the fifth largest economy in the world. And I think that that's, those two things are intrinsically uh, intertwined. And so we need to look to ourselves as being um, the entertainment industry about what we can do to reduce our carbon emissions. And so that's what our um, goal has been um, to find onset solutions and implement sustainable production practices. Okay. Hey everyone, my name is Max Schwartz. I'm from IATSE Local 728, Studio Electrical Lighting Technicians. I'm the chair of the IATSE Local 728 Ecological Conservation Outreach Committee. Uh, we formed a couple years ago uh, just in response to seeing all the carbon emissions that we as a department uh, contribute to set. Uh, I think we're probably the largest on set. And so uh, we set out to tackle that as well as other smaller sustainability issues like reusable materials, uh, and even uh, down to equipment we use, uh, and everything helps. Um, so um, yeah, we, we uh, mainly are working on the alternate clean energy initiative, which is like electric generators. And uh, yeah, here to talk to you all about that. Hi, I'm Michael Prince. I'm a production designer, art director for uh, TV commercial, a member of Local 800 and Local 29 in New York. And I'm not a chair of our Green Committee, but just a lowly member. Um, <laughs> and uh, we uh, concentrate on alternative materials research, uh, education and training. I see Zena here, that's nice to see her. Uh, circular economy solutions, resource sharing, either info or through an app like a you know creating a database where people can in real time share uh, information about materials that might become available um, and just 
building community and camaraderie among folks that want to participate. So, yeah. I think that's terrific. I mean, this, last year when the Art Directors Guild really came into this space, it brought our attention to materials, sustainable materials, and a lot of us have been questioning things that we've been working with on sets like foam and other toxic things that just hadn't gotten the attention until the art directors came on board and said, let's, let's look at this. Um, you were also, Allison, going to mention about EcoSet and some of the circularity that Local 600's been involved with. Yeah, as Lydia's saying and Michael, I think when we first talk about material circularity, we think about our director's guild specifically, but we've been looking a lot at ourselves at, at Local 600 about what is the waste creation that we are um, contributing to. And so one of the things we've been working on the last two years is P-Touch cartridge recycling, which is a big waste uh, issue on our end. Camera assistance, you know, using them day to day. And so we started to partner with camera rental houses across the country. We are currently um, partnering with over 40 in all the cities you can think of. There is one, most likely. Um, it's an ever-growing, ever-evolving process, but this, when we talk about P-Touch, we're talking about kind of a product that's at the end of its life. And so what's been really exciting for us is we've been looking long-term for a solution for something that is more for items that are still, you know, able to be reused, right? But they're just not the newest thing, right? It's gaff tape that is half used. No one's gonna sell that at a, uh, you know, a vendor, but what can, is that just sitting in our basements collecting dust? Like, where is that going? So um, we were really excited to partner with EcoSet and Chris Barber. She's been a force of nature here in LA. And um, can you just say what EcoSet does just yeah. in a minute? So EcoSet, um, it, it, they take materials from events and productions and then they organize it, sort it, and then they recirculate it back into the community for film students, for the theater, film, TV community, and it's for free, right? So anyone can come make an appointment and grab this material um, out of their warehouse and um, here in LA. And so um, we partnered with them to work on camera expendables. And so that's something that we are just starting to get off the ground and we're really excited to see um, that process grow. So now anytime between 8.30 and 4, Monday through Friday, you can go to EcoSet, no appointment necessary, drop off camera expendables, and know that they're going to get into the hands of someone else who will then um, get to reuse it. And it's just, again, just trying to do material circularity as much as possible and not letting things collect dust and go into the waste bin. Thank you. So we have an inter-guild and union sustainability alliance, and this alliance has two key working groups right now. We meet um, quarterly in the aggregate. Um, it's, um, I will say, you know, there are over 500,000 um, union and guild members working on production sets uh, in this country. It's a big, it's a big sector. And uh, this Inter-Guild inter Union and Sustainability Alliance represents all of this sector. But in our working groups, we have one which is about climate storytelling, which is the Writers Guild, East and West, and the Producers Guild. And we've done trainings, um, climate storytelling trainings with our memberships, and we, have, uh, we get together to sort of figure out what creative resources we can pull together and share to create and expand our knowledge for climate narratives. Um, the other working group is around clean energy, which, you know, pretty much everybody up here is a part of. And um, this, is, this is an important group to us. Uh, as the studios have been calculating carbon and the carbon footprint and collecting the data, we became aware that the, the, the lion's share of our carbon footprint is fuel. And it can be anywhere from 48% to over 50% of a, of a production's carbon footprint. And that is across the board, an independent film, you know, a, a regular studio feature, a tentpole, or even an episode of television. It is the thing that we should all be focusing on. And so um, our clean energy group includes DGA, PGA, IOTC 600, and the lighting technicians, Max is part of the LA local 728, but we also include the New York local 52 and Atlanta uh, 479. Um, we also have the Teamsters in New York taking the lead, and I'm going to tell a story about them a little bit in a little bit. But first, we wanted to transition to talk about leadership 
a little bit. And th this sort of relates back to this idea of building a culture of sustainability on set. And Todd, can you talk about the new work that we're doing at the DGA? Yeah, um, we right away identified education and leadership and empowering DGA members in every category, ADs, line producers, I mean, ADs, uh, UPMs, uh, second ADs, production coordinators, um, directors, empower everybody that you are a leadership voice on set. And so what we did was we kind of we kind of looked at um, DGC Ontario, we looked at their online resources, looked at uh, um, Green Production Guide, and we really wanted to collate all of this into a, a resource that was tailored to really busy people who needed to get the information they needed in an organized and push button way. So we created the, um, the DGA Pro Tips for Sustainable Production and they are on the landing page of DGA.org. They are accessible to the public. It was important to us that everyone have access to them. Um, their push button accessibility to detailed, it's a detailed climate action checklist category, like item by item to empower um, us to create sustainably. Um, and that they embrace the four pillars of leadership and, and communication, um, uh, carbon calculation, clean energy and materials. Um, we've, we really believe, and it's been my personal experience that you just need to speak up. <laughs> And at every point, I, I'm doing these m uh, musical movies in Vancouver, which is a incredibly green place. And the first movie, I just was a little overwhelmed by the resources that I had in a very short amount of time. And I we didn't really get the production working green. Second movie, I came up and I said, we have to do this. And we tried to hire Zena. <laughs> we, and we were unable to find that money because it wasn't in the budget from the beginning and we were really over budget by the time it became a topic of conversation, but we did work very hard to be sustainable only because I said we have to. And, but that voice can come from anyone on the crew. It can be uh, an art director, it can be a production designer, it can be you and every time each one of us speaks up, you inspire somebody else that might have been thinking, oh, I should do something. I did an episode of a CBS show in Vancouver and I was seeing plastic water bottles and my trailer was heated 80 degrees when I got there at, at lunch. And I made a little video of everything that they could change and I sent it to the line producer and by one o'clock or whatever, at three o'clock that afternoon, she was implementing changes. She was, she you just needed someone to point at it. It was because you know, it's like we're in a business of last minute crises and and uh, we need what we need when we need it. Nobody, we, we just really have to be the ones to lead and speak up and say business as usual just doesn't work. And everybody is very fear-based about change as we hear in the Clean Energy Committee. Everybody is reluctant to make a change and but uh, there's a lot that you can do just by being, uh, leadership comes from speaking up, no matter where you are in the food chain of filmmaking. So, you know, we probably believe you need to advocate and educate. I, I'm, as I say, still seeing single use water bottles. There was no course. We have the big topics of clean energy. We're really trying to make changes, but you have to mention all of it because there's nothing too small. And as, and as Buyers, we have tremendous buying potential as a as a as an industry to our vendors to lead by requesting what we need. I go to my Korean donut shop and I tell her, I don't want your plastic bag. You can keep it, but can you get rid of them, please? You know, I just I'm telling everybody because we just don't seem to understand. Um, communication is key, and we just keep stressing: later is too late. Make a difference today. So whatever you do, whatever you can inspire your production to do, it's better than that we were before you arrived. So wherever you're at, um, I always say, I tell everybody, it's like going on a diet. The hardest part is starting. Once you get started, it all starts to feel very natural. So. Yeah, the um, the DGA uh, sustainable pro tips are we we kept them open to the public, so anybody can go on dga.org. You could see the pro tips box right on the home page. Click it, and it's just a great resource for anybody to kind of see a lot about the stages of 
where you, you know, how you start in the very beginning, and then, and then how, as the different department heads, different crew people come on board, how people are integrated, and it's often the early people um, who are on board who are making a lot of those important decisions um, about things that will impact the sustainability of, course, of the show. The feature director or the producer director of a series, they get in early and they have kind of a foundational uh, um, effects on the setup of the production. But like I said, I was on a I was a guest director on an episode, and I was able to suggest changes that they glommed onto. So there's no point where your voice is irrelevant. We also are doing other education. We um, we edu we really really wanted to sort of uh, supersize um, BAFTA Albert. Yeah, BAFTA Alberts. They're one of the leader, global leaders in sustainable production training. And so we supersized one of their training events. And instead of teaching 12 people, we did 12 people on a Zoom and had 300 people watch and take the training at the same time. And we're making that resources available on our website to members because of our contract with Albert. Um, and we also just did the same thing with uh, National Resources Defense Council about climate storytelling. And we had a, a, tr uh, a, a a, tra a, a training session with NRDC um, that is available to DGA members only because of our contract with them. Yeah, thank you. And there's 18,000 DGA members. So. Almost, almost 19. Okay. Um, Allison, uh, you've been a longtime advocate in Local 600 and recently were part of gathering a swell for an important resolution for the cinematographers and the camera department. Yeah, um, so I feel like in our committee we talk a lot about all the work we're doing is great, but it feels like a daunting task to address climate, the climate crisis that we're living in and that we really need ideological change. We need something really, you know, we can, we can do an e-waste event, but it's like we need to stop the waste at the start, right? We need to stop the creation from the beginning so we're not just fixing a problem later. So uh, last summer I attended an IATSE education and training uh, webinar that was really meaningful. It was titled, um, The Impact of Climate Change on IATSE Worker Safety and Health. And for me, personally, it was a turning point in how we frame sustainability in the context of what we do for our work. Um, we realized that if we explained that being a member of the camera department, being a member of, of any department on set, you are a climate worker, right? You, we are out in the field very often on location in extreme heat, extreme cold, tying it to worker safety was something where it finally just sort of clicked for people. Um, and so what we ended up looking at was our mission statement, the Local 600 mission statement. And there is um, a statement where it says that we must fight effectively for a safe workplace. So we set out to define what is a safe workplace. There are many components to this, but one of the ones that obviously you know, pertains to the world of sustainability is it needs to be a workplace that is free from environmental hazards, things like UV radiation exposure, um, things like heat stroke, air pollution, things like that. And so we, with the support of many DPs in the industry, we started to draft a letter to our executive officers that then was brought in front of the board. And in February of this year, we passed the Local 600 Sustainability Resolution. And what it set out to do was declare our commitment to encourage and endorse carbon neutral productions through sustainable onset practices. Um, this could be things like using more uh, sustainable fuels like renewable diesel, um, encouraging the transition to electric grid tie-in, um, all of this in an effort to uh, achieve industry net zero. That's the ultimate goal. So we're really proud of this resolution and we feel like this is a really defining moment towards a positive change internally for us as an organization. Um, the last thing I'll just say is Local 600 is an institutional ally of the Labor Network for Sustainability. They're a really wonderful organization. If you're not familiar, definitely recommend looking them up. Um, their motto is something that is just really powerful. It's called, or their motto is, making a living on a living planet. And I think this goes back to what I'm saying about worker safety. I think that in the end of the day, taking action against climate change is fundamentally about job protection, right? We don't have a job if we don't have a planet. So if we're union workers, we need to look at the bigger picture because in, we can't have a job if there's no place to live on, right? It's that simple. So again, for us, tying it into worker safety was a really key um, moving, you know, changing point or tipping point for us, I think. It's great.
Max, as a lighting technician, you are really in a very, you know, important place in terms of innovation and clean energy. I'm curious how you came to be this, uh, to take this position, and um, tell us a little bit more about how you're going about it. Uh, well, I spend a lot of time around generators, um, you know, breathing in their fumes, um, just seeing the effects of it, um, having neighbors complain about the sound and the smell of it. Um, and it just started to bother me time and time again. I mean, even the other day, um, working with a generator where I have to run additional cable to it. And as I'm breathing, as I'm next to it, I'm right in the way of the exhaust vent, which is pumping out so much fumes that I have to hold my breath just to uh, tie in cable. And so um, between the between the global initiative that we're all fighting for and uh, comes like our our own health and safety on set. Um, and so I think that um, that's an element that a lot of my coworkers don't really recognize or they ignore, be it the sound of generators. They're extremely loud up to like 60, 90 decibels. Um, and so these electric generators like Moxion and the J250, they're, they're silent, emissionless, um, and not only that, but they're easier on our bodies. You know, you run less cable because you can plant this generator right next to set. And that's less toll on your back when you're laying down 60, 70 pound cable for, um, for hundreds of feet. Um, so we decided, we did a lot of research and, you know, as you all are seeing, this technology is now coming into maturity. Um, and it's finally to a point where it's useful for us as set lighting technicians on set. We have a very high energy demand, um, and so and so um, a lot of our what we work towards with the IOC 720 Eco Committee is informing members about what you can do with this technology that it's reliable, safe, helpful, and not only large scale but small scale because. You can't just fill up a uh, electric generator with gasoline in a couple of minutes and have it keep running. You know, you have to build systems around this technology, and a lot of members, both within my local, particularly my craft, and even Teamsters, are worried about this technology it, as a as a, a potential threat to their job. What if this goes down while they're in the middle of filming, like, and they don't they have to waste hours of production's time and money to bring in a diesel generator? Um, and so a lot of our focus is on educating the membership. Um, back in April last year, we uh, had a power station showcase where we brought in a lot of these vendors, invited our membership, and showed them firsthand the power of these products, that they can power our largest lights for hours and hours and hours. Now, it's, it's not in a direct equivocal uh, to the diesel generators, um, but it's strong enough that you can build a new system around it. You can adapt to this technology in a way that embraces it. Um, instead of just filling up the generator whenever it needs gas, you build a system where you leapfrog it. You know, you take natural breaks in a production cycle, like lunchtime, and you swap them out, or you meet the energy demand of the product. You use low wattage LEDs, that can, are not demanding so much of the product itself and you can extend the lifespan of it. Um, and so between that, we also were, partook in um, the Clean Mobile Power Initiative event at Sunset Gower. Uh, we're grateful for having us a part of it. Uh, it's really important to just spread the news of it too because a lot of people don't even know about these products, let alone are fearful of them. You know. Teamsters in particular are fearful that this will take their jobs away because they just see it as a battery that you plug into. And so a lot of time is spent, uh, you know, quelling their worries, explaining how it, it's, it will, you'll retain your job. You know, it's just making your job maybe a little easier and safer at that. Um, and so um, this, this technology, it's, um, like we were saying earlier, you know, it's it's still in its infancy, and you need really communication to bring this product on. We 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 are doing a lot of information because we're finding that you need to ask for this 
technology in order to get it, and it's a struggle fitting it into the budget. Um, it, you know, it's new technology, so it's a little pricier, um, but there is some cost that people don't realize that um, it's mitigating. Uh, you save a lot on diesel fuel costs. Um, for example, we filled up just 60% of our generator yesterday on set, a small 350 uh, kilowatt generator. That costs $200 that will run us maybe three days. So over the course of a week, that's four to six hundred dollars that people are not seeing when they're looking at the price tag of these generators, electric generators, in terms of cable as well. Um, and not only that, but the accessibility that this allows at airports, tunnels where you can't have these products because of fumes, national parks where they, they're worried about oil dripping on the ground. Um, it saves a lot of costs. And um, so a lot of this is about meeting up with members. I've been called um, for several productions to council members on the benefits so that they can go and talk to productions and explain to them how this saves them money uh, and how it helps them out as well. Um, because um, a lot of people are just, they just don't know enough about it. So um, we'll, 728 is a lot about education. Uh, we have a rigorous uh, classes to make the most proficient set lighting technicians in the world. Um, and we're working on cl creating classes around this technology, inviting the vendors into our space to um, educate the membership and just make them aware of the technology and its limitations so they can feel comfortable using this technology uh, and feel comfortable going to producers and asking for it because um, conversations we've been having as we're trying to get them on set is that um, it's hard to budget for this item if they don't know that we want it. And um, in many ways, we as the set lighting department need to work with them because you know we can meet in the middle somewhere where maybe we can afford to give up a light or two if it helps secure these objects on set um, and and help. Um, help our lives in so many ways, um, even down to small products like the EcoFlow. Many of you may know uh, the household brand EcoFlow. Um, they're small 2,000 kilowatt uh, gener electric generators. They're so helpful on set because you can, you can plant them right next to Video Village. You don't gotta run cable to it. You're saving time, you're saving production's time and money. It's just making everything faster. And I think we're finding that um, it's not that hard to power your base camps completely with clean energy now. We're sort of working our way up to full set lighting, but, but small sets and the base camp, you've got solar trailers, you can you know, the, do the video village, you can power your overnight trucks with clean energy. It's, there's ways to sort of create clean mobile power plans for your production that you have to, you have to sort of think about strategically What's your, what's your location, what's your stage situation, what do you need, and how can you integrate what's available from clean energy now, because we're still waiting for it to, you know, to, for the supply and the demand to come together, right? But I think the other thing, Max, what you were talking about in terms of the cost, um, one of our colleagues from DGC, Clara George, created this um, emissions cost optimizer that we put onto the DGA um, sustainable pro tips. So if you go on that site and look under clean energy, look for this, we call it the eco um, emissions cost optimizer. And it's a spreadsheet where you can enter all the, d the data of your diesel option, um, all the particular details you need to compare it to a clean energy option. And it will give you the differential both in price and, and carbon emissions. And it makes it, 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 it sort of takes away that bias of the optics when you, when you worry about what you're spending up front because it immediately carp, you know, calculates in the savings that you have from not you know, spending it on the diesel. So for the, you know, for the bottom line people, that it's really useful, I think, to, to use that in your arguments. Um, did you say everything you wanted to say right now? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. I mean, Max is a superstar. We're so lucky to have him, you know, and we learn so much from you. Um, and now Michael from the Art Directors Guild, and you're, you, you had talked about how you come onto a project very early, 
and that carries a certain amount of influence because having that Quite early a bit. view. Quite a bit. Yeah. Um, as designers, we're on the job really early, uh, much less so now as schedules start to get more and more compressed. But uh, that allows us to exercise our influence in where something is being shot or how a story is being told or where locations are, how they're grouped together or whether we're building something on a stage or uh, you know, trying to achieve it on location. All of those decisions impact the entire production. It, I, it had never occurred to me before, and I've been doing this for a very long time, that the title production designer, it's not just about the story or what you're trying to show on the screen, but in fact the entire operation, uh, and oftentimes you know, I'm able to you know, move a production from being a tremendous stage build or some absurd location that's too far away and just say in private to my directors or producers like we really should try to move that because it's inefficient and not just inefficient from an environmental standpoint but from a crew standpoint if i have to have twice as many set dressers to be able to service or pre-dress a location on the other side of town while we're working over here then it's i can't monitor it i'm driving back and forth it, there's a snowball effect so trying to keep it um compressed and together, there's an advantage there. So we often try to operate like that. Um, and you have a personal relationship I, to I do, clean energy. I do. I, do. Uh, I mean, I've been working on this, in this industry for about 30 plus years and I've ordered my fair share of dumpsters and inhaled a good bit of diesel smoke myself. <laughs> and it seemed like the low hanging fruit is really transportation, energy, certainly the waste uh, that doesn't really account, as important as it is, it doesn't really account for as much of the carbon footprint as the rest of it. That said, uh, it seemed like we should go after these specific aspects first. Uh, I have a partner, Wendy, who's here, and together we, uh, Start, we have a startup, it's called Charge System, and the we're in the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator and Clean Tech Open. I encourage you to look those up if you don't know what they are. Uh, really great organizations working to help people with ideas to start a business or create a product to bring it to life. And I don't tell know, us what you designed. Yeah, so uh, it is a uh, it's an all-in-one. A 44 foot long trailer that gathers together all of the ingredients that anyone would need to pull off a sheet. So we just looking at the traditional equipment that we order on every single job. There's power, there's water, uh, waste management, uh, restrooms, uh, unit supplies, and I'm forgetting something, communication stuff, walkie talkies, and first aid. Every single job, it get, the same order gets put in. I work on a lot of commercials, so it's very, uh, that's a particularly, uh, uh, I, I'm being delicate about the term. It, they kind of rely on these legacy vendors and it's, uh, there's a routine that happens the day before a one day shoot where we send out you know, two or three trucks and we go and pick up the same stuff from the same vendors all around town, only to use them for a day and then return them the day after the shoot. So uh, the attempt is to compress the logistics of that to make it far more efficient. And, we think and, and these are electric trucks. These would be electric trucks, yeah. We're also talking about a, a, having a small fleet of purely electric, medium duty, class five trucks. Uh, that would. Yeah. I think that's amazing. What I, love, what I love is that you saw a gap in the, you know, you saw this sort of excessive trucking inefficiency and you and Wendy who is a costume designer I love it the costume designer and the production designer designing trucks so electric trucks and getting them into the marketplace it's fantastic <laughs> um, did you want to say anything else yeah, um, yeah. yes <laughs> yes uh, I was I was thinking about uh, for years, as a production designer, if we have any art directors or designers here, then you know that when you're on set, 
uh, you don't often have a home. We don't have a vehicle. I don't have a chair with my name on it. Uh, I didn't even have so much as an Apple box until just a few years ago when my prop master bought me a custom Apple box with my name on it. It like changed my whole world. <laughs> because finally I felt like I had, well, certainly a place to put my stuff, but people could identify that that was my location, for lack of a better term. Uh, I, I came up working with a designer in New York named Therese Dupre. Maybe some of you know her. Fantastic. I love her to death. Miss her terribly. And uh, she told me that, you know, really where the rubber hits the road is at camera. And if you're not there, you can't really advocate. It doesn't matter how beautiful your set is if they're pointing in the opposite direction. So you have to be there to kind of remind everyone what the plan is. And like, the plan was we were going to shoot this direction for this reason. And oh, okay, great. So if you do that, then you can, uh, you can really, you know, do your job by, by being there. So this is all to say that. Sustainability is a very kind of uh, intangible idea. It doesn't have a, a physical marker. It doesn't have a form. When it's really functioning well, it's a subtractive process. It's uh, communicating. It's understanding ideas about equity and, uh, and the environment. So our attempt is to bring a, a form factor to that idea and have there be a representation of sustainability on set and so our system represents that as like a place for crew members to come to and communicate about these ideas uh, you know make plans for how they're going to dispose of certain materials um, and yeah so uh, that's the that's plan. great that's the plan. Yeah. yeah no it's wonderful it's wonderful um i'm just gonna i just want to add one more anecdote from our interguild work, and then we're going to open it up if anybody has any questions that you want to ask. But I, something happened this past year that was really kind of remarkable and really kind of a proof of what we can do together when we work together. The um, the New York Teamsters, um, who have a they actually actually in New York, Tommy O'Donnell, Mike Devereaux, very pro clean energy and. Um, luckily, they are the Eastern Regional Motion Picture Teamsters, so they carry a lot of clout. Um, and I think I think Lindsay Dougherty is on board. I hear she's on board. Um, but they they wanted to bring renewable diesel into New York. It, it, it's it's out here in California at the pump, but we haven't had it on the East Coast at all. I don't know if everybody knows what renewable diesel is, but it's a synthetic fuel. It's a drop-in. Uh, fuel that mimics diesel, but it's plant-based, animal fats, hydrolyzed, and it's 80% um, of the carbon emissions of regular diesel. And some cities have converted to it. Um, New York will, by the end of this year, will be the first city on the eastern seaboard to convert to renewable diesel. But, but the Teamsters came forward and said, we think there's a tank in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, near a lot of the studios and stages where we're working, and we talked to them, and they, they said if we brought renewable diesel into New York, they would put it in the tank for the entertainment industry. And so we began this conversation all together, and the studios got involved in the conversation a little bit, and we kept pushing and working. We knew New York was on the verge of going RD as well. And we, um, we started to talk to the vendor directly who was gonna bring it up from the Gulf Coast and he just wanted to know that it was gonna be used. And it really was something that we got behind and coordinated and um, it happened in January. And, and so when our productions went back to work in March, most of the ones in New York, and we all started following up, we all started calling the UPMs and the line producers and we said, the RD is there, you have gotta use it. We told the guy we're gonna use it. And, and, it, and it happened, and it's, um, it's really, um, it's a bridge to electrification. It's not the, it's not the end game. We wanna, we wanna, you know, we wanna make this transition to electrification, but until we can get there, because it may take another year or two to get all the way, we can use RD as a replacement, and we, you know, are really encouraging um, people to use it wherever it's available. 
Oh, really, I, I also wanted to make the point, it was a coalition effort in the end for, for New York City. It involved a lot of different groups. It involved the con you know clean fuels for New York. It involved the League of Conservation Voters. It involved the Truckers Association who, you know, everybody who's working around diesel is kind of over it. So um, it was really great to see everybody come together and for our, for our industry to be a part of it. Okay, I think we can go to Q&A. Um, I think, uh, speak as loud as you can and we'll repeat the question. Yeah, um, thank you for being here. I wanna bring up something that is usually the elephant in the room, and this is, the culprit is not only fuel and diesel. If you notice, the food in this conference is vegan. There's a reason for it, because animal agriculture is one of the main causes for global climate change. We know that by now. We know it takes 2,000 gallons of water to create one pound of beef. So what about making the no, food plant-based? I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. That, that is something that we do talk about in all of our initiatives. And in fact, is um, Stephanie here from Default Veg? Stand, stand up. Take a, take a, <laughs> take away. You can, you can read about Default Veg and the Better Foods Foundation to get some ideas about how you can start to sort of gently move people away from, you know, people don't have to give up meat completely if they can start reducing it. And we often have Meatless Mondays on sets. We um, do different things, but um, I won't go into it right now because we crunch for time, but please do look up the Default Veg and the Better Food Foundations. We're, we're messaging that very heavily. And even at our awards, um, at the DGA, Todd was successful in sort of getting um, the red meat off the menu. Red meat free. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for raising that very important point. Does anybody else? Hello. Okay. The question is, what can young people do outside of the guilds? I want to say that's one of the main reasons. I try to post it on my Instagram. I'm not a huge influencer. Saying, I know many of your filmmakers. You're, you're, we, this is on the DGA facing page. You know, I fought very hard to get it on the face, on the landing page of DGA.org. It's not, you don't have to click through anywhere. It's right there and it stays there. So it's there. If you're making films on your own, if you're, you should go there. It, it still applies to you if you're producing, if you're directing, if you're assistant directing on your short films. I mean, I can't speak to everything in the world, but we, we touch upon travel, upon uh, meatlessness, about everyday action. We used to say you gotta recycle and, and repurpose the, the food you, 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 you don't eat so that it doesn't go to waste and it's given to people in need. So they, we try to be very complete in the whole spectrum on the, in the pro tip. So please go as category by category. And if you are speaking as a creative person, what you can do as a young person, there's a lot of, tips there which you can either use directly or interpret because it's links to resources and to me it's like educate educate i still my young kids i talk to them every day about the plastic and the garbage and the things but it's it's overwhelming to young, my kids i have triplet my husband and i have triplet 14 year olds and that you can't go shopping without being buried in plastic I mean, I've been to Restore, you know, in Studio City, and it, but you can't go anywhere without being buried in plastic. So it's it's overwhelming to them. But I think the best thing you can keep saying is is learn what you can do and do the best you can. As someone brilliant once said, we're not looking for a, a ten million people to do it perfectly, one million people to do it perfectly. We're looking for a billion people to do it imperfectly to move the needle. So that's what I would say. But start with what the resources do exist. And look there. I also just want to give a shout out to the Green Film Schools Alliance since we're talking about youth culture. But Brent and, uh, and Erica, and I think Harry Weiner was here, but um, these are these are people who have been leading. How many Green Film Schools are in the Alliance? 40. 
40. And uh, there's a website, there's um, resources, there's regular meetings, and um, it's part of growing the sustainable culture before before they hit the union. So um, we're looking forward for you joining us uh, with all the students that you're training. Lydia, I would also just say, I know I mentioned the labor network network for sustainability earlier, but they are a huge power force for young workers. There's a young workers listening project just specifically dedicated to this type of conversation. They are, you know, unions and guilds based, but this is a non-union and union issue, right? So I, I would definitely point you in that direction. I think they have a lot of really amazing resources and um, it's a very powerful group of young people who are really trying to affect change. So that's a really good organization to look into. Thank you. Anybody else? Right here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Maris. Thank you so much for this. I'm an independent producer, and my next project, I am partnering with a much more seasoned producer. She's deigning to make a under $1 million budget, so we're at that level. I'm very passionate about this. How do I approach her, somebody who's, this will be her 40th film, to get on board with me spearheading some of these things among the departments of this film. It will be a feature, not a series. Yeah, I mean, I think that, it, you know, having the conversation early on is really important. And I think, you know, my colleague, Mary Jo, and I, we always say that, you know, whenever we start a film, you, you want the director on board first. Because the, the higher the buy-in, the more modeling is there for everybody who is um, part of the team. And so, you know, there are the resources. I'm not sure, we had a QR code that we were make it, gonna make available. It's okay, it's scrolling on another screen. On that QR code is a list, first of all, it's a list of all the initiatives that our unions and locals are um, bannering that you can take a little bit of a deeper dive into. And we also list a couple of tools and resources sites um, with the Green Production Guide and the BAFTA Albert um, site. Both of those are very leading in terms of resources. Um, and it's really, you know, when you start, it's really about taking a look at your unique production and evaluating what achievable goals you can set. I mean, we're all hypocrites, like, in some way. We just do the, you know, but the, I think the strategy is to where can you make the most impact and set those goals and then and, and set them in a way you can make them. And uh, that's, you know, it's just the earlier you start, the more chance you have of success. Can I say, I, I, it's very true, start early, and go look at the pro tips, because it'll tell you what you want to fight for. It's all listed there, quote, category by category, and know that if you, if this is general information for making a larger show, if you can convince, if you can hire a sustainability supervisor, as I tried to do, um, but failed, I'm going to do it on the next one for sure. I'm going to, because you got to get in the, you got to get the conversation up really early, because as soon as money's, I tell you, it's the hardest thing to shove an extra fee in there. So, but if you, if anybody can hire a sustainability supervisor, we are hoping studios mandate them. Many studios do, but not all, and not on all productions, even the ones who do mandate. So it's, you need someone watching that for you. Making a movie is a very hectic thing. So when somebody, you know, else is watching that, you know you're still gonna achieve your goals. On my production, when we couldn't afford that person, the production coordinator had had experience doing many of these things. We did the peach and the pear, we did the car calculator carbon, we communicate with departments, we did a lot of stuff, um, but we didn't have that person who made it all happen in a great way, so. You, you might also find that it's cheaper to yeah. work sustainably. Yeah. Uh, if you're sourcing your materials from previous productions, if you're uh, you know, keeping your locations compactly uh, located, yeah, there's plenty of ways that it becomes a much more cost-effective endeavor. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question before we wrap it up. Anybody? Okay, there you go. Well, I mean, I know, I know a little bit about this. Uh, sh shout out to Electric Bill. Uh, he, I think he's watching online. Um, <laughs> friend of ours uh, uh, who is a uh, production manager for Rock and Roll Tours. And uh, th there is, the equipment's available. We've been to the ride and drives. We've tried the uh, 
you know, class five, class six trucks. And uh, they're, especially the hydrogen ones, are capable of traveling pretty good distances. And with a good bit of planning, you can, you can pull it off. I mean, it, it definitely requires a change of mindset. It, you can't go 600 miles at a clip. Uh, but if you're doing a little bit at a time and you have batteries with you, then you can you can make it work. So. Okay. Um, I just want to sort of echo as we as we close out here what Todd was starting to talk about. Um, I think as global warming rises, the calculation of our carbon footprints becomes ever more important, so that we can really be strategic about how we are. Um, addressing and progressing on reducing our, our carbon footprints. And um, so, you know, having an environmental steward or a sustainability coordinator on set is really um, becoming more and more imperative for this data calculation. Um, this person also is able to support department heads. I mean, we already have full-time jobs when we're making movies. Um, anticipating the challenges ahead before you're in the dilemma uh, problem solving is something that these coordinators can do, and um, we're really trying to push for that on our on our sets. And as I think Michael said, oftentimes you can find ways to create an efficiency out of it and and cut costs um, at, while you're, you know, while you're um, making your production cleaner. Um, so I think I think from our positions, the the things that we're trying to do is to sort of get the diesel generator thing under control. I mean, New York has actually banned elect, uh, diesel generators in residential neighborhoods. You can only have electric generators or take them off and put them somewhere else. Um, you know, there's, there's um, you know, we need trainings, you know, for the, for the guild and union memberships, uh, trainings, environmental stewards, uh, mandates from studios. I mean, there's mandates around health and safety. There's no reason there can't be mandates around sustainability. So these are the, all the things that we're kind of working on um, on our end, but mostly we're really creating an allyship across the across interdepartmental allyship, and really supporting each other. We don't have to know, you know, we don't have to know everything that it takes for every department to do their job sustainably. But it's good that we're aware of it and that we, you know, there's a Venn diagram on one of the models where you can kind of see the inter locking circles of how departments interface. So if you're, you know, if you're if you're worried about set wall circularity, that involves, you know, the production designer, but it also involves the director and the DP and, you know, many other people. So these are conversations that have to happen all in a unified way. And that's what we're working for in building this culture. Um, so Allison, do you, oh Todd, yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure because we are very production centric. I just and this is Lydia's passion, but I want to make sure we remember climate storytelling is essential to solve this crisis. We're entrenched in a capitalistic system, a capitalistic narrative that's highly funded that preaches um, 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 convenience and abundance that we are out of. Convenience has to be rethought, and we abundance is no longer you know, where we live. We have to conserve, we have to repurpose, we have to create circularity. So, but those stories aren't being told in ways that are grabbing big audiences. If you want to kill your Instagram following, just talk about climate change. I mean, it's just like, we have yet, to me, only Mr. Mr. Beast can make that interesting, and he only does that once in a while. So just remember climate storytelling. The rest of us will make these movies as you write them, but, but it's an essential part of solving this problem. Yeah, what I would say just to wrap it up is I know it feels, like I said earlier, a daunting task. It feels like we have an uphill battle, but there has been a serious momentum in the last couple of years. If this is any representation of that, there is a growing coalition of unions and guilds that are creating green committees. This is in the last year alone, I think there's like five to eight new green committees within IOTSE. It's a big deal, right? Like we are shifting the need, or we are, yeah, the needle is shifting and we are moving forward and I think that there is positive change happening and the more that we talk together interdepartmentally, that's where we're going to affect change because one person 
is powerful, but we are more powerful together. And so I think that, um, you know, it's an exciting time. I think this is, it can be a depressing thing, but we can look at the positive side. And I think that, um, yeah, there's a shift forward and there's a growing momentum and we're excited to be part of that as best we can. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. It's great to be here with you tonight.